September UC0079. The RX-78 II entered service and almost at the same time the Federation's fortunes changed. So obviously the RX-78 II must have played a large role in the Federation's victory. Well, not really. When looking at the name of the series, Mobile Suit, Gundam, it's easy to conclude that the RX-78 II Gundam played a large role in that victory. But while it wasn't insignificant, it also wasn't the big game changer you might think it was. And no, I'm not going to say that its mass produced version, the Jim, was what won the war. It definitely helped to bring the war to a quicker conclusion, and it also made it more likely for Federation pilots to survive, but again, not quite as instrumental as you might have originally thought. So today I'm going to go over some of the underappreciated units that played an instrumental role in the victory of the Federation. But first something that could be a big game changer for you, Opera GX, the first browser built specifically for gamers. Okay, so what does it do? It's got features like GX Control, a system that allows you to cut down on RAM and CPU usage, but what I personally like the most about this browser is how it feels less like a traditional browser and feels more like a user interface of a game. There's a subtle sound whenever I open up a tab and going over my preset sites also feels very satisfying. By the way, that hovercraft effect is something you can edit in the menu because that's another feature that they're all about. There are so many customization options that I can't even begin to go over all of them now. You can even choose to have background music playing, which will automatically stop when you play a video and will automatically resume when that video stops. Or if that's not your thing, you can head over to the GX player and play your own with Apple Music, Spotify or YouTube Music. And it wouldn't be a gaming browser without native Twitch and Discord support. So come on and get your game on with the link down below. So the units that won the Federation the war. The most famous one of these is without a doubt the humble Type 61 main battle tank and its variants. While they were outgunned and outperformed by Xeon's revolutionary mobile suits, they were eventually able to fight the Xeon onslaught to a bloody halt and gave the Federation the breathing space they so desperately needed. The biggest problem with the Type 61s was that they simply weren't designed for combat with Minovsky particles in mind. Beyond line of sight fire was now impossible and at closer ranges they lacked a gun elevation to hit critical parts of the Zakus. Another problem at close range was the higher mobility of the Zaku, making them even harder to hit. All of this combined with improper anti-mobile suit tactics due to inexperienced commanders led to heavy casualties amongst the Type 61s. But even with all of the odds stacked against them, their numbers allowed them to hold the Federation's front lines for over 9 months after which they were finally able to go on to the offensive. Operation Odessa It might have been the first large scale operation where mobile suits were used, but it was the tanks in combination with the air support that actually won the day. The Type 61 also had an upgraded variant, the M61A5, also known as the Type 61 5 Plus possibly referring to the 5mm larger main cannons. Other upgrades were a satellite data link system and an autoloader that reduced the tank's crew to only two, a driver and a commander who also acted as a gunner. Of course, as I said before, the Type 61s couldn't have done it alone. Perhaps even more important for the Federation was the fight in the air. And while I always thought that it would be either the Tin Cod or the Saberfish that were the kings in the sky for the Federation, you know, because they looked the most like a conventional fighter, it was actually the Fly Manta Fighter Bomber. Not only was this the most produced aircraft of the war, but it even had excellent speed, maneuverability and cruising range. 
And the first two things I totally wasn't expecting. You really cannot judge a book by its cover. Other than being the apex predator of the skies, this thing even packed enough punch to shoot down Zaku's. Just like the Type 61s, they would be seen on all of the battlefields on Earth and ensured that no matter how bad things were on the ground, the Federation would always maintain air superiority. In fact, their control of the skies was so blatant that they could relatively easily supply the wide base even when it was deep within Xeon control territory. For the heavy bombing missions then, the Federation would rely on the Deprog, a heavy bomber that could deliver 120 tons of freedom to whatever Xeon base was unfortunate enough to be designated as its target. And despite being used in UC0079, it is said to be inspired by World War II era bombers. And bombs weren't the only things that these things could carry. A remodeled Deprock could serve as a mothership for three Flydart ultra high altitude interceptors. These machines were used to great effect to disrupt the Xeon supply lines, and it's said that their pilots were all aces from the Earth Federation Space Forces. So, despite the relatively low amount of Flydarts used during the war, they still managed to shoot down a significant amount of ships and HLVs. It doesn't matter how amazing the mobile suit is you're piloting, if it doesn't have any fuel or ammunition. In space then, the biggest unsung hero was the public class assault boat. Another vessel that took inspiration from World War II equipment. Gunboats this time around. The idea was that, in order to bolster their devastated space forces, shuttles would be retrofitted with anti-ship missiles turning them into ad hoc fighting vehicles. And just like the gunboats of days gone by, the idea was to fire the missiles and then make a quick escape. Their most important contribution was during the Battle of Solomon. Here their anti-ship missiles were replaced with beam diffusion missiles. Thanks to that anti-beam smokescreen that their missiles spread, the Federation fleet was largely unaffected by Solomon's heavy beam defenses and they could now advance much easier onto the asteroid base than they could normally have done. At the Battle of Abawaku, they would attempt the same strategy, but with a much less successful outcome. What did remain unchanged, though, were the large amount of casualties that the publics took during these battles. While they were fast, they lacked armor and their agility also left much to be desired. As a result, many of those who launched would never make it back. And the last machine then is of course the Humble Ball. But since I've already done a dedicated video on this thing, I'm just going to put a link on screen and down below so you can go check it out. And that is all for this video. These weren't all of the non-mobile suits used by the Federation, but they were the ones that played the largest role in making the Federation's victory a reality. So let me know down below which one is your favorite non-mobile suit, non-mobile armor machine. Personally, I've always loved the original Core Booster, but since it was never built in sufficient enough numbers, it didn't make it into the video. Well. It kind of did now, but you know what I mean. Anyways, as always, a big thank you to the Patreon supporters. I hope everyone watching has a great day, and I'll see you all next time.